everybody and uh, welcome to another interviews uh, with the experts and we've got a new uh, expert here Tomo Littlewood his name's actually Keith he uh, he lives in Dubai I, we, I said to him oh, I used to live in Dubai I lived there for, for three years but he's been there for eight years he's got a, um, a wife and three kids too that live with him um, in Dubai he's got his master's um, in endocrinology and I was just saying to him, you know, what, what is it? Because a couple of our coaches, um, Nikki and Angelina, have done, you know, one of his um, courses just to learn more about, you know, hormones. Obviously, you know, our program attracts women who have a lot of hormonal issues um, from all the crazy, dumb diets that they do. Uh, but maybe, Tomo, just because obviously this is our first one that we've done, could you just tell the viewers, just give them a little brief, you know, who are you? You know, and, and you know, what, 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 why do you do what you do? Sure. So I, my background is really as a rehabilitation trainer. I, I study lots of rehabilitation and therapy. I've spent thousands of tens of thousands of pounds on therapy courses. And now I'm kind of moving away from that because I, initially I got into um, holistic lifestyle coaching where I was ruining people with low sugar diets and, <laughs> and paleo type diets about 12 years ago. And that's probably when I was at my most constipated thinnest though. I was at my thinnest, I was constipated and probably most anxious and uh, a pain to be around. And kind of after that, I got into functional medicine, lots of testing, uh, too much testing. And I, at the same time, I was getting into, into the work of, uh, of Ray. Um, and that's primarily where my kind of drive from and to study these days has come from, is hmm. looking at the vast amount of work that he's put out there and all the other scientists' work. So I, I think for me now, it's kind of trying to take my own synthesis of all the biology and endocrinology and put it together and to, to, to help as many people as I can. So typically my work these days is it's not too dissimilar from yours. I just don't train people anymore. I'm mm -hmm. kind of more involved in coaching and looking at, um, you know, really energy digestion, sleep, mood, fertility, all these kind of things that primarily can be resolved with a good sound nutrition program. But sometimes beyond that, they need a, 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 a little bit more of a foundation to work from with perhaps supplementation of, of, of hormones. Mm, mm. And it's, we were actually just talking previously, I was um, just telling Tomo how like I, you know, my period's really regular now, pain-free, you know, it comes, it just turns up. I'm like, oh, I'm bleeding, period's here. Um, and it's it, prior to that though, when I, and actually when I lived in Dubai is when I had the miscarriage, but back then that's when I was eating, like my diet would be green vegetables, you know, rice, nuts. I used to eat bloody flaxseed oil and tuna, green beans. Um, oh. Yeah. And it was, it was my period. It was irregular. It was painful. I'd get cramping. I actually, I, when I had that miscarriage, they found out I had polyps and I remember just walking, I was walking back from work one day and all of a sudden it was just like this blood was just gushing out. Of, they must've burst. Um, yeah. and it was horrendous. I remember just like sitting in the lift going up that gym, you know, where I used to live at, um, on the beach there, I can't maybe you said the name, going up the lift with my husband was crying because it's just all this blood yeah. gushing out of me. And, you know, when we went to the doctors, they were like, oh, this is just normal. You know, like it's just normal that you have period pain and we'll just go in there and do a D and C and, you know, it, it's, and then obviously I was like that for a, a long time until I found Emma and Ray and Dodie and Rob um, yeah. who we've been talking about. And I think, you know, so, and the reason I was like that was all of these stupid diets that I was doing and flogging myself with cardio. And I think yeah. so many women, you know, they're, they're killing their, their health and their body to try and achieve a, a look or, or a certain look. But I think what they don't realize is that you will actually look better and feel better yeah. if, if you, if you, if you don't, if you don't do that. Um, and, you know, uh, we, we talk, we talked previously about estrogen and, yeah. you know, it, it's the same thing with menopausal women. Like I'm obviously only 38, but we get a lot of women who are going through menopause and they get all these menopausal um, issues. And I think a real common misconception is that when you're having period pain and, you know, when you're going through menopause and perimenopause that you're deficient in estrogen. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that there are problems because and it's not just um, within the, the misconceptions at the medical level is, you know, e even a lot of the lay books, your Cosmo magazines will blame certain aspects of, mm. of the cycle. I was looking at a, 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 a review in the obstetrician and gynecological societies 
uh, review and it was saying something along the lines that well if you score this much in the luteal phase then it must be a progesterone issue because the luteal phase is associated with more progesterone mm. but if you're not if, if you're not considering how much estrogen is around and what it does mm. to perhaps degrade say the corpus luteum which is known to produce more progesterone you can't just blame a hormone on a phase mm. when you don't accurately know what the other hormones are doing and you know with probably the people you've spoken to before in raised work it's notoriously hard to measure estrogen in the blood mm. you know it acts as a sink within the cells you know you can look at it at other markers like perhaps assessing prolactin but ultimately the symptoms can give a real great indication i mean you know the, the classic sign of estrogen dominance in women who are trying to get pregnant is a miscarriage because you mm. know nine ten eleven weeks to work towards the end of that first trimester if you don't have enough oxygen and nutrients available, you don't have enough stability because you're not producing enough progesterone. You're not, perhaps you don't have enough thyroid. You don't have enough energy. But ultimately, estrogen is given a chance to flourish. It can create, you know, hypoxic tissues, and it, it's not a great environment for for anything to survive in. And so, I think that's where the, the misconceptions come from: is that there's this dogmatic belief that as soon as a woman comes to menopausal kind of times. This, this dogmatic belief that estrogen has to be low. But yet throughout pregnancy, if you're not producing enough progesterone, it's well known that you're going to have problems. Mm -hmm. So if your ovaries are going into aging or in decline, why is it the assumption that estrogen, which is a proliferative hormone, it creates growth, it creates more tissue, it increases the tissue around the uterus, you know, it's known to increase, you know, fibroids, endometriosis, polyps, unwanted tissue growth throughout the whole of the body mm. but yet progesterone is known to differentiate just like thyroid it's a very organizational hormone why aren't clever people thinking organization versus somewhat of disorganization and chaos and 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 that's what i kind of like about ray's work he's made a good distinction um about that and and you know i think he was one of the first people to kind of call you know foul on the fact that you know in back in the late 60s when he was assessing the role of estrogen on aging or syne or, or, the, or to create aging and senescence within hamster ovaries and uteruses you know um mm. that th 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 this was around for for a long long period of time but yet nobody really kind of looked at the dangers of it until the, the woman's health study came out and showed that hrt was mm. causing real issues and then they kind of flipped it to say, well, actually, we found that estrogens and progestins are causing the problems as well. So maybe it's a progestin, but then it's assuming that the progesterone is progestins and it's not. It's a synthetic mm. version, different chemical bonds and causes just as many problems as estrogens. So it's, it's difficult for a lot of people when all of this information and a lot of the studies are just kind of perpetuated by large organizations who want to make lots of cash and mm. if they come out of it that they've made mistakes in the past it's going to leave them open and, and that's that's unfortunately the, the 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 state of the land and you tend to sound like a conspiracy theorist sometimes <laughs> oh but i you, know yeah. <laughs> We get we, yeah. like I get ripped in our bloody Facebook page and just maybe before you go on, because I think um, just to simplify it for some the women listening, perhaps you can start by explaining the female menstrual cycle and the two hormones, progesterone and estrogen and what they actually do and what their function is in, is in the body. Because I think a lot of women don't really understand what sure. they are and what they do. Yeah. I think it always sounds weird when a guy is telling a woman about the menstrual cycle. <laughs> I've got to presentation next week about it but just an integral part of biology and hormones that it's another function but yeah typically we have the the, uh, the, the follicular phase where typically what happens is um if the ovaries um need to develop usually you'll have some kind of input from from the brain to tell them to produce more estrogen so this follicular phase will often produce a bit more follicle stimulating hormone and that will produce a bit more estrogen primarily estradiol e2 which mm. is the more potent estrogen. And that's really there to stimulate growth of, um, and stimulate the, the granulosa cells to produce more estrogen. In that phase, you get kind of increased tissue proliferation and growth around the uterus. And it's generally there to make the environment just a little bit more hardy. It's almost, it's almost like weight training for the, for the uterus to start <laughs> off with. Um, so, and then what, what, what happens in this phase, everyone talks about estrogen as being the primary thing. One of the issues that starts to occur if, progesterone should be being produced throughout this phase as well in the background 
Now, often what tends to happen is around about the surge where we get a lot of luteinizing hormone being produced, which is to stimulate ovulation. So we have obviously um, uh, the, the luteinizing phase, um, which is typically ovulation. And then you get the release of the, the oocyte with the um, corpus luteum. And this is where we start producing a lot more progesterone. Now, I think, and I, I kind of alluded to it before, is that within that particular stage, is we see a lot of people blaming progesterone because mm. it's the progesterone phase, but mm. yet the increasing estrogen amounts that aren't being kept in check by enough progesterone. And there's a, a, another factor in this as well, going to digressing slightly, which you'll find I do a lot. That's um, all right. I'll keep, I'll keep you on track, don't worry. <laughs> is that all of these phases within the follicle phase and the luteal phase, they're thyroid dependent. Mm. So thyroid acts as a number of things. You could say it acts as an antioxidant. It's, a, it's a, another organizational hormone. It kind of tends to act as, a, as a, um, a differentiator. If there's not enough thyroid hormone, you will get changes to, to all aspects of, of reproductive tissue. Mm. So you might get estrogen being able to run more rampant because there's not enough thyroid there. Equally, we know that when there's not enough energy there, not only are you going to have not enough progesterone available, but you're not going to have en enough thyroid hormone available. And so many so, women would be in an energy deficient state and their thyroid probably isn't functioning as it should be because they do what I did. You know, they, yeah. they cut calories they don't eat the right nutrients, you know, so they're to support their body and their metabolism. They don't get enough sleep. They drink alcohol. There's all the stress. So it's like, you know, it, I, I would say like 80% of fucking women probably do this yeah. and, and not even yeah. realizing how much it's actually affecting them. Well, you know how many, uh, I'm going to use females because yeah. I've never met a female client. I probably get about two clients walk into my office each year and go, I don't care about my weight. I just want to fix this. I've had enough for a long time. Yeah. But there is obviously the societal pressures and the kind of conditioning that they've been around growing up as a kid that gets them focusing on their weight. Mm. Now, it's easy for someone to run around in this high stress, high adrenaline, high glucagon producing states, liberating energy from stored fats because that adrenaline feels normal. It feels mm. normal to run off that state. And if you're kind of worried about your weight, you kind of run around in that cycle going, I'm not going to eat so I'm not going to gain weight. It's impossible for me to. But we know that there can be some nuances behind that. So running around in that stress state all the time is probably the prime precursor of why estrogen is going to run rampant. Because when we produce these stress hormones, thyroid hormone is suppressed. We find progesterone is suppressed. That If we're using the kind of concept of the, just the receptors for a minute, is that progesterone, instead of binding to its associated receptor, will often have to bind cortisol and glucose because it's running around in that stress state so mm. the, the receptors are often a poor thing to consider but it's useful to consider that they can't be bound to in that particular state so coming into that um review of the cycle again it's like we tend to see a lot of people that are just simply blaming progesterone and, and also when a woman's been taking contraceptives mm. you know the role of synthetic progesterones the progestins <clears throat> are often poorly thought about as part of that cycle. Excuse me. <clears throat> and so, we, you know, one of the first things that we can do to, to, to modulate estrogen levels is to make sure that your body's running on an even keel. Mm. Um, you see a lot of people, I was looking at a paper yesterday, that people, uh, that these researchers were saying that, you know, estrogen improves glucose metabolism. Well, okay, that's great. It is going to, it's going to increase clearance initially because estrogen always stimulates glycolysis. So if you think about our two energy producing kind of pathways, we have our aerobic metabolism that tends to use carbohydrate quite efficiently and fats um, um, using oxygen, producing carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. energy and water as, a, as an end product of that. But when we switch to glycolysis, because estrogen can degrade aerobic metabolism over time, mm. it, what often the night switches to this aerobic, anaerobic, not anaerobic, sorry, form of glycolysis. Mm. So this glycolysis is very, very inefficient and wasting because it wastes glucose and it can waste oxygen if it's, if it's in um, a, a chronic phase. So you would expect that when you add estrogen in, it will clear glucose efficiently. But the net effect of that from a long-term perspective is if you look at cancer cells, they regulate the same gene expression in cancer that makes them more um, effective at blocking all of the, the toxic drugs like um, chemotherapy. Mm. 
So you're kind of stimulating a pathway just to clear glucose that has the same effect that makes cancer cells more robust and, and they don't go through programmed cell death. They have this kind of uh, replicative immortality. So they're able to keep perpetuating themselves despite all the stress that, that a, a physician might be throwing at them. So saying that estrogen is good for glucose metabolism is, is, is really quite poor because the, the long-term effects of that are quite destructive to the body. Mm. And that's where I think where the problem is for a lot of people is that east, we, we tend to look at some aspects of function that estrogen might have as being quite protective. Mm. And if you're looking at something in a microscope, you are going to see a certain reaction. But when you pull out of it, you see all these negative things that happen in a, in a chronic state. And that's why I still think we're kind of stuck in this paradigm which is really back in the 80s and 90s when people were prescribing a lot of HRT saying ovaries are declining, estrogen's heart protective, estrogen's protective against all this stuff. But hey, oh, what we found now is actually estrogen causes thrombosis. It's also, um, it also seems to be linked to breast cancer as well and all of the other kind of negative cardiovascular diseases that were being shown. And I think now there was a paper in the BMJ last year that came out and said, well, actually, taking the pill now seems to be linked with lower ovarian risk. And, but when you looked at the data, I think there were three out of, I can't remember how many thousands, of, there were thousands and thousands of people. And over a certain period of time, we're talking about something like 30 million hours of life, the ladies who'd taken the pill had um, some out of the 1,200, had about 430 cases of ovarian cancer, where the wow. ladies who hadn't taken the pill had 700 cases of cancer. So when you start adjusting the, the, the odds ratios and the risk, how they look at um, the studies to say if there's a real risk there, you can probably show, well, hey, that extra 300 people has to be down to the women who have never taken um, the, the um, con contraceptive pill. But if you're not looking at their environment, what their diet's going on, mm. how stressful, how much stress they're under, you know, all, all of the other aspects. You can't make that distinction. But yeah, it's easy to separate, say, hey, we have a taker versus a non-taker, the taker within this subset of people. I mean, if you're looking at women and you're not comparing environments, say, rural to, you know, mm. urban, for example. And there's, there's some studies that have come out that have shown in Mongolian women compared to UK women, for example, that rural Mongolian women produced vast amounts more progesterone than the urbanized women who were producing way less progesterone. And this tends to be the factor that I think is, is lost on a lot of people is that the organizational protective hormones that seem to be um, instrumental in, in creating change, you know, look at progesterone perhaps for traumatic brain injury, for example, it shows some very, very clear positive effects, whereas estrogen doesn't. And I think when you apply estrogen in the short term, uh, frame of things because it can almost act as a stressor you know mm. that upregulates the pathways of serotonin and cortisol you'll have a very short-term adaptive response that seems really really quite protective mm. um, it's a bit like in certain laws of thermodynamics you can apply a stressful principle in into mm. a system that's going nowhere and that kind of initial stress might take somebody away from that to make their biology function better. But then if you keep applying that stress chronically, it would just degrade someone's system again. And that's what I think we need to look at with estrogen, what it does to the system over time. I think too, like you look at a lot of women that come into our program, they've had all these um, menopausal issues or menstrual cycle issues and they've gone to their doctor and they've put them on the pill or they, they've used the marina and they're so scared to come off um, this because you know it just it's just masking all their symptoms but what we've yeah. found is you know once they get their diet right you know they're eating enough food and the you know fruits and juices and they're eating the liver and the oysters and getting the right lowering stress getting sun they find that and then putting some progest e that they actually fix those issues like they disappear you know like i just there was a lady posted in our i shared it on our instagram today like she's like you know pcos all these other issues everything's improved in 11 months and mainly just through food, food and progest yeah. and sun, you know, and, and, yeah. and it, it, it's, uh, I think though it's so, women are so, and I was the same because I, I just didn't know any better. You know, I would go yeah. to the doctors and they'd be, they just take the pill kitty, you know, yeah. just, just take the pill. And what, why is it that, that the, that this, it, the issue initially can mask those symptoms? You know, why do they, sometimes you, when they take it, they're like, oh, I actually feel better. Yeah, well, what you talked about there is when you're putting something in that kind of shuts down 
aspects of the menstrual cycle. If you think about what estrogen does, it plays havoc with blood sugar levels. Mm. So from a stress perspective, it can push someone to where it's a bit like running off adrenaline again, right? So mm. if you're kind of feeling that everything's kind of suppressed, if you had painful menstrual cycle and you take an excess estrogen, which suppresses the menstrual cycle, you're not going to have these negative things going on from a short term. And there's these kind of, it's a bit like, I, I call it the zone of dogma creation. Mm. It's like if you've been doing any kind of diet, let's say you've gone from really high carb to low carb, mm. uh, perhaps your biology wasn't able to, to use the carbs efficiently, and now you're kind of cutting back on that. If you're going from high meat eating diet to vegan, there's going to be this short window where everyone goes, I'm doing this diet. It's absolutely amazing. You should try it. It's really working for me. And it's like, come back in two years and tell me what the function's like then. Because everyone will always wax lyrical about this new diet that they're doing that has some really short-term benefits. Mm. It's like when you go low carb, you are going to go lose some weight initially. You are mm. going to lose some, some um, glucose from the liver. You are going to be burning through fats. You, that does feel wonderful when you're running off a drilling for a period of time. Mm. And I think the, 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 the use of estrogen is analogous to that. And it's like mm. there can be some short-term responses. But clinically long-term exposure to exogenous estrogen or external sources of estrogen has shown to be problematic over time that um even soy for example there's you see a lot of nutritionists going yeah soy safe soy does this and that mm. there's a couple of big studies that i've looked at uh, one is just the uh, exposure of soy and it said basically it has the effect of a, an external source of low level estrogen over time now, there's a, a researcher called, um, I think her name's Upson. I'm not sure if it's Katharina Upson. Maria Upson, I think it is, from the States. Mm. She's done a lot of data. and A lot of it's epidemiological data, so we need to be aware of the limitations of that. But she's looked at soy formulas that have been uh, given to um, areas of women in Africa and their children and shown that but because of all these supplements where, you know, NGOs have gone in and say, hey, we're giving you all this great free food, for example, the long term exposure to soy has shown that basically any woman that was consuming it from birth is exposed to a high risk of fibroids, endometriosis, uh, excessive menstrual bleeding in the early ages of their, their men. Are, you know, when they start their cycle, these mm. things are happening almost straight away. Mm. So we think about the long term exposure to estrogens and whether it's from, say, the, the, the phytoestrogenic effects of soy, uh, the effects of um, contraceptive pill. And we know, for example, within the environment that a lot of these pollutants and it's it's been well, well shown by the endocrine society that pollution is instrumental in cancer, heart disease, metabolic syndrome and diabetes because of the effects it has on the endocrine system. Mm. So what you're then saying is the pill is safe because it has this effect. But what happens when you're, you're around a stressful environment, when you're exposed to more pollution, when you're eating foods that perhaps have phytoestrogenic effect, plus you're always pushing yourself through a hole where you're either exercising, not eating enough, or you're the average housewife running around trying to please everybody, get, getting everybody fed and, and off to school and skipping food because you don't have time to eat. And these are the ef chronic effects of, of estrogen. So whilst it's like, you know, we are seeing some beneficial effects in the short term that make women feel better, unless you know what's going on from the food perspective and, um, you know, their stress levels, mm. it's really hard classify whether they're actually feeling better or not because we we need to put it on function now if you're giving someone the contraceptive pill and you're stopping their menstrual cycle i've spoken to many clients who said my doctor says it's fine that i don't have a menstrual cycle i'm like well biology tends to say that generally as a rule of thumb healthy um fertile women will have a menstrual cycle now there can be healthy women that don't have regular menstrual cycles mm. but i think you have to marry that with their actual symptoms mm. and i always use kind of five or six questions if something's working for you your digestion's good your sleep's good your mood's great your libido which is a good sign of your ability to want to 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 reprogram and, and create create little versions of you right and um did i say sleep as well energy digestion sleep mood libido I think, those, I think those five questions a really good sign of something's working for you or not to and totally I yeah and those are the things that so many other programs don't measure or well, all they yeah. measure is you know and i see because obviously i'm on instagram and i just scroll through sometimes and there's like you know women selling 
you know, you know, 12 week programs and get your body here and four weeks this. And, you know, like it's just about, you know, how shredded you can get um, yeah. or how lean you can get. And no one actually measures those things, you yeah. know, and, and, it, and it's, it's when women come into our program, we're like, you know, you need to look temperature, pulse, sleep, digestion, mood, energy, yeah. menstrual cycle, hormone balance. And you need to fix those things first because you're not yeah. going to look like you want to look and be able to yeah. sustain it and eat a decent amount of food. You know, like previously I could eat fuck all and I did exercise all the time. Now, you know, I strength train three days a week. I've got the best body I've ever had and I eat the most yeah. food I ever had have. And yeah. my period, all those things are good for me. So I think, you know, like you say, it's, they're so, so important and you can't rush it. You know, like it takes, yeah. like, so many women, they've fucked themselves from 30 years of dieting, yet they want to right. undo that damage in months. And I'm like, it's going to take you years, probably. Some of you. Sometimes. Yeah, I, okay. I, 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 I would agree. I'm going to swear because I like swearing too. It's a fucking yeah. minefield. <laughs> yeah. People are, when you look at social media and you have some people going, oh, you need to try an alkalinizing diet. Oh, you need a oh. low-carb diet. Oh, you need a vegan diet. And it's like these things over a short period of time may have some benefit. If you've been eating just loads of shit food, fried food, junk food, yeah. like, junk food for purpose, and then it's not that bad if you're having it once or twice a week, right? Yeah. But if you've been eating a diet like that, that every single day you're going to McDonald's, yeah. there's a reason why you're going to feel shit, and then when you come off it... You're going you, to feel better. You're going to feel a yeah. lot better, right? And yeah, totally. Get, like, time frame, but the thing is, it's like... I, I, I see, I have to kind of, some, I work, like working with clients, as I said before, who challenge me because they say, mm. well, I've been told this, this and this. And I go, okay, well, look at it this way. Go and experiment with that and then tell me how you feel. And until people kind of start experimenting with it and get out of their heads that if you've been experiencing this for 15 years, we're not going to wave a magic wand and it's just going to disappear straight away. Mm. But each week that goes ahead, you're saying, oh, actually, I slept a little bit better last yeah. night or you know, I didn't react to that person at the office. I'm feeling a little bit more balanced or, Hey, my menstrual cycle, I wasn't experiencing cramps this time around. Yeah. So it's paying the trust of someone for them to experiment. But, you know, we're in this culture now that, that results have to be like that. Yeah. You know, and I think you, well, what we both do is that when you have someone who's external to seeing why someone's had a really shit week, Oh, I had such a bad way. And then you go, well, you haven't eaten for eight hours here. That's why. Yeah. You're not yeah. You just need a little bit of guidance and hand-holding to say, okay, well, actually, most of the stuff that you're doing is self-induced because you don't know any better and you're so mm. used to running on this. And I think that's what's valuable about our work is we're providing not it is education and hand-holding exposure to a path that it does seem it's like it's just where is that path for most people? Yeah. I think, too, like I always say to women, I'm like, like, cause people argue with me and be like, Oh no, this diet's better. I'm like, well, look, really? I say to them, do whatever fucking diet you want, but come back and show me a diet where you can eat over 2000 calories a day, where you sleep eight hours a night, where your menstrual cycle is regular and pain-free, where your digestion's great, you know, flat stomach, yeah. your mood's good. You have a strong sex drive, your temperature's this, your pulse this. Go do that diet and then measure all of yeah. these things. And the diet that's the best for you is where all of these yeah. things are good long-term. You know, like they yeah. might feel good initially, but then it just goes down. Like they'll go away, do keto, be fucking, yeah. be vegetarian. And I'm like, but they've got like, it's so interesting. Like I, I'll even get like, like we are in other coaching programs, like our business coach and I'll even have women in from his program in my program, other fitness yeah. coaches, you know, and they're like, oh, like fucked up menstrual cycle, but they're out there preaching yeah, but they're learning themselves, yeah. you know, they, they didn't know, know, and it's like me, they didn't know. Um, but it's, it's just so interesting. Like when you dig a bit deeper underneath the surface, like they think everything's fine on the outside, but when you dig deeper, it's not, they're not sleeping. They're fighting all the yeah. time. They, they're constipated, you know, and I've, and I've never ever done, and I've done every diet every, and I'm, I'm really resilient and consistent. So I've got yeah. lean doing every diet. I've done every protocol of fasting, I've done shape, a shoulder isogenics for 12 months. I've managed to get lean on everyone, but I was fucked. I was fucked. I was fucked. You know, this is the only like diet where I've been or approach where I actually feel good. I'm yep. not obsessed with food. And I, I, I look, because you can look good too. Like I just don't believe either. Like if you spend enough time and you train and you heal your body and you eat enough, like I've spent a lot of time eating a lot of food. 
you know, like I've trained my body, like train my metabolism to be good. Basically, you know, I think you, if you put the work in and, and you, you know, um, do the basics consistently, you really can have it all. You can have a yeah. great body. You can have a great metabolism. Yeah. Mm. I, 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 always, I, I found a great way of weeding out clients who are really kind of uh, ready to change. And I say to mm. female clients, when I, got, I see a little bit of doubt in their eyes and I don't think they're for the right reason, I say, how do you feel about gaining some weight on this program? And if they start panicking, I, I know they're not ready to come on. Mm. Some of them, and I say to them, look, I'm not saying you're going to gain weight because mm. it, not, not all my female clients gain weight. I said, but if you've been stuck in a stress cycle where you've under-eaten for the last 10 years, running around like an anxious bat, I use the word bat, not... The, yeah, yeah. yeah. Stuff, um, get into trouble. Um, and so uh, what do you expect to happen? Do you not expect when you start eating a little bit more for the body to go, finally, you've given me something, what I need. I now feel safe. You know, there's that great quote by diane schwartz being that you need to get um healthy to lose weight right mm. it's like if you give the body what it needs it may just rebound also the fact that you might actually be storing a little bit more glucose and water in your liver mm. which mm. is going to make you a little bit heavier and that's i think it's really important to understand that if you're still focused on on that goal of weight loss but your menstrual cycles erratic you're not sleeping your moods all over the place you bounce from anxiety to low mood states you, you can't change that. You're never going to change that until you're ready to say, I want to change the things that actually make a difference. And then perhaps your kind of issues and your kind of whole outlook to weight will actually change then mm. because you'll start to feel better. And you might actually find that, well, actually you didn't gain any weight or you might have gained a little bit of weight and you actually feel a little bit better than you did before, which is a step mm. in the right direction. Mm. Yeah, and I, I think that's a challenge for, for some, some ladies and some guys to get their head around. I had a guy recently who his wife referred to me, low testosterone levels. Mm. Um, and he said, my wife sent me, I'm really healthy. I'm in the gym six days a week. I eat a low carb diet. I'm not, I, I don't think really there's much that I, you can tell me that I'm going to, to, to have to take on board. I'm like, why do you think doing what you're doing is not contributing to your low testosterone levels? And I didn't hear from him again. But, and that, but that's, that's okay for me. I don't feel like I've lost out because if you want to keep pushing yourself in that perspective and not understand the basic biology, you will be stuck in that state until you're ready to learn. I yeah, think that, yeah. I think too, like I always say to women, like, look, like, cause it's taken me probably four years to get here. Like I've been doing this for four years and I've had periods where like I wasn't consistent and I probably still drank a bit too much alcohol. I don't really drink at all now. Um, and I'm really consistent with my food and my training, but it's taken me that long to get, but you know, I'm nearly 40. So that's 10% of my life. And I think, well, that's actually not a long time. You know, like if you look at it in, in the scheme of things, like now I'm going to be free for the next, well, I'm planning on living to over hundred. So like 60 yeah. years, you know, I say that to women, you know, you've, you've been doing this for 20, 30 years. It's not unrealistic to think to, to get to where you want to be with your health and how you want to look. Cause it's okay to want to look better. Like just do it the right way. You know, investing two years to be free for 40 or 50 or 60 years is not a long time. And once you build this foundation, I find now for me, it's so easy to sustain. Yeah. Like yeah. it's really easy. Yeah, that's the thing is like people, and it, it kind of permeates through from the, I think from the, the, the medical kind of attitudes as well is that, you know, you're going to have to take this to sort this out. And it's like, mm. if you look at kind of like Ray's approach and adaptive responses, adaptive nutrition, people don't understand the concept of how to interact with their environment. Mm. They just perceive the stress that's around them. And when you start to kind of give people all the things that they need, that kind of attitude becomes, I think becomes, a lot easier to people mm. you know, actually I see change occurring here uh, and it, but again it goes back to wanting to create that change and say well actually I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna start experimenting with this and see if we can create some change and it's like unfortunately I mean you look at the, the environment here the environment here it's one of the most polluted in the world mm. and that has a huge effect and people will bounce from person to person going for different tests being told they have this, being told they have that. But we know, and certainly the research that I did, was that if you're accepting blood tests without understanding how much stress someone's under, mm. we know that pollution can hijack the receptors that people are then having these hormones specifically tested and mm. everything appears completely normal. So you go from pillar to post, seeing specialist after specialist being told, this is normal, this is all in your head. 
um, you just need to try this medicine or you need to try that. And it's actually, you need to sort your food out first of all. Mm. You need to see your sleep pattern now. And when you start to get those right, even stressful environments, I mean, I have issues here every now and then. It is really polluted the air. I'll, I'll know what I need to do because I'm not doing enough of what I should be doing, which I, what I tell other people to do. Mm. And that's the thing. Like sometimes when you're in an environment that's quite stressful, you, you perhaps have to follow these things a little bit more rigidly than perhaps if you're Absolutely. In, in a rural yeah. area, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and I, I think, think that's I, a and that, that, that is, I think you've really nailed it there. You know, like it's not as though we live in an environment where we're out in the country and there's no fucking stress and we get eight hours of sleep every night. You know, that's one of the reasons like I, you know, I, I talk to this, to the women about this all the time. Like I do put my body under a fair bit of stress. Like I sleep, but I work really yeah. long hours. Like I'm up at like four 30, won't finish to work at eight o'clock, heavy strength training, you know, like running a company like it's stressful so for me yeah. like being really on point with my nutrition is like it like every fucking day you know i eat the carrot salad i track all my food i eat my liver yeah. my oysters because if i want if i if i'm putting my body underneath in all this stress and under this stress it can't cope unless i give it the, the, the fuel and i think you, you nailed it the women stressful jobs they drink yeah. alcohol They've got yeah. kids, they don't get enough sleep and then they under eat and they don't eat the right foods, which makes it even harder. So I think if you, you've got to support your body, like yeah, you have to. Yeah. And you know, it is, it is about more is more. And you know, I think Ray came up with some great quotes a couple of years ago about, are you reducing within your environment or are you kind of expanding with it and getting bigger with it? Mm. And it's, and, and that's the thing is because, People are told that when you fast or when you calorifically restrict, you get all this growth back, but you're not, you're just restricting physiology. So these symptoms that have been restricted are because perhaps you're not eating the dairy, but actually the dairy is not the problem. It might be the magnesium, the vitamin C loss, the, mm. the high poofa diet. It might be the, the, the damaged digestive system that you have from stress and eating and drinking too much booze or something. Mm. No, he's just frozen. We've had such a great uh, run so far. We had a bit of issues um, when he first jumped on because he's in Dubai and we didn't think we'd be able to use Zoom. So he's just frozen. I'll just message him and see if we can um, get him back on. All right, we just... Uh, we're just getting him back on. It's always a bit hit and miss with Dubai with um with Zoom. We'll just get him back on. Are we back? Hey, yeah, we're back. We're back. We always have a little bit of um, bit of technical issues, but keep going. I can't. What were you, what were you saying oh, about the environment? This, yeah, yeah, the stress. Yeah, yeah. And so you know, the, the thing is, is these days is that there's a uh, there's this misnomer about, and you see it from some really well respected biology researchers, but then you see some other ones who are totally say, well, what about this? And it's like calorific restriction extends lifespan because it slows metabolism and it's like well that kind of you you're probably slowing something down maybe you're slowing death down a little bit but mm. the thing is it's like when you, when you cut back and you make the body colder uh, and you restrict these nutrients and you make the liver less prone to function that might be great for somebody who's got a really good flexible biology and that's why you see someone go yeah i fasted it's great look at me i'm radiant i'm great and it's going mm. great um, but then your average, say, female that's running around, they're more prone to hypothyroidism. They're more prone, yeah. prone to autoimmune issues, you 10 times more. You're living in a very polluted environment. You're perhaps knocking back a couple of vinos a night and you're kind of skipping breakfast and stuff. These people are the people that are more prone to getting fucked up from, from doing the calorific restriction in the fast. Mm. Mm. But they just don't know it yet. And that's the problem is like, Calorific restriction is probably, and fasting is probably really good for somebody who overeats. 
Mm -hmm. If you're prone to overeating and consuming large amounts of calories without having the metabolism to deal with it, then it makes sense and then cutting back is going to probably do you some good. But mm -hmm. that's probably about it because there is another body of research that says that when you give animals in enough energy and you maintain a solid metabolic rate, these animals are probably going to live longer than the calorific restricted ones that have got colder, uh, mm. that have slowed down the metabolism. And there are, there are various you know, scenarios and, and variables that will impact an individual. Perhaps it's how much endotoxin or the gut function. Perhaps it's the emotional relationship they're in. Perhaps it's the inherited traits from their parents. There's mm. a number of things that makes everybody variable. But I still think with, when it comes down to cellular function, despite all this variability that we're said to have, mitochondria are mitochondria and we require energy, we require proteins, we require light for these cells to function efficiently. And to make somebody function better, they need to be on an even keel from an energetic intake for the body to feel that it can expand against all the challenges rather than shut down. And you do see people who, you know, that perhaps respond well to fasting short term, um, but then long term, that it becomes a disaster and you mm. see the same thing with clients that go um i went vegan for a month and it's like but i just i was ruined after that i had to i had to come back on and start eating animal proteins uh, and it's it's the same for a lot of things don't get me wrong you probably see some people that respond really well and they do function with a vegan diet but they might be in the very small minority and over a long period of time those exposure to kind of high phosphate low calcium what are the effects on their physiology over time? We still don't know enough about long-term diets. I think there's one guy who started the vegan society. He died at the age of 90 recently. And there mm. probably are some people that can. He lived in the Lake District. The Lake fucking district is idyllic. There's no stress in the Lake District. It's lovely. Yeah. It's, it's like it's, it's surrounded by clean air. And, you know, it depends on the environment. And for many people these days, that environment is nowhere near what the Lake District is like with clean air and, and, and you know, lovely scenery to walk around um, mm. every day. So we've got to give people the stimulus that they need to overcome these stresses. And mm. I don't think fasting, slowing down liver function, slowing down the ability to detoxify estrogen, all of these things that happens when you kind of restrict calories. And that's why we see all the people that we do see mm. because they've been bamboozled to think that the restriction is the thing that they need to create to create the changes. And all they're doing is just suppressing the symptoms because the digestive system's not being used as much or, um, you know, the ability to, to regulate hormones efficiently aren't being done effectively. Mm -hmm. So you can restrict, but I don't think you can create growth and expansion from that. Well, I think you just survive. You don't thrive, you know, and so many women, like when they, and I was the same, you just set you up to binge eat. You just binge because yeah. you're hungry and you end up eating shit. You know, like I'd, I'd eat yeah. packets of biscuits and Domino's pizzas. And, you know, now I, I never binge eat now. You know, we, we have like, I have white chocolate in the cupboard for when I make fudge and, you know, coconut or potato chips and they just sit there and I eat them when I want to. But whereas previously I'd be, you know, I've got chocolate fudge in the fridge. I'd eat the whole fucking, yeah. you know, container till I felt sick, you know, cause you just, you, yeah. you, you can't ignore the biological responses of you. You can only ignore them for so long and eventually it gets you, you know, like you just, I need to eat. Um, yeah, but sugar is addictive and it's going to cause cancer. So it's addictive as cocaine. That as cocaine, as addictive as cocaine. And you know what, we should do another one on that. Um, today's been a really yeah. good one, just a good overview, I think, about dieting and hormones. And, you know, so ladies, yeah. you know, I think the take home is, is you, 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 and I think that the fitness industry sucks you in because they yeah. play on your, you want quick, you're desperate, yeah. you're sick of feeling fat, you look cool. in the mirror and then you're like, fuck, which quick fix diet can I do that's going to drop pounds like that and you know you look at and look oh god i'm not perfect and like i got fucking fake boobs and i talked about it this morning on the bloody thing and i used to get botox but then obviously when i started doing this and like i talked to kate about it and then we decided to do the skincare i was like well you can't get botox kitty like it's not good for you one and it's not in yeah. line with what you're trying to promote so i've been botox free for 12 months now i've got it for about 18 months but you look at a lot of these fitness models and they're they smash themselves, but then they fill their face full of fillers and Botox. So they look yeah. like they look good, but really they're not, they don't look that good. You know, like if you look at me, I mean, I've got lines. Yes. But my skin's pretty amazing. Like, yeah. you know, like I've got really good because the liver, the oysters eating adequate calories, yeah. like and I'm not stressing my body, but you see so many of these fitness models and they're super lean and they're, 
you know, full of Botox and it's not really yeah. a true, like if they didn't have all that shit in them, they look pretty, pretty crappy. Yeah, you see, I think what the problem is, you, you see, sort of, I, sometimes I kind of just look into someone's page and you see, this, you're so inspirational. You, you look great. It's like the fucking starving. Yeah. I've seen, very similar, <laughs> I've seen very similar people who come to me and they're trainers and they're having the same menopausal symptoms in their late 20s and early 30s that you would be expecting in the 50s, mm. right? Mm. And it's like, you, when, you, when you don't eat enough, you restrict the amount of progesterone that you can produce. Mm. And you have, to, you have to kind of start producing more because your ovaries aren't functioning that well. Often, because you're um, not producing enough progesterone, even the adrenal glands can be activated to produce more progesterone, just like that the classic symptom of, of menopause. And I, most menopausal women that I've worked with have got rid of the flushes and that when you give them enough progesterone calories and usually a bit of magnesium Same. inside. I think. And it's, it's, and it's relatively like, easy. Yeah. Yeah. And it, when you're trying to liberate fat from uh, uh, energy and from glucose from stored fats, you're going to be running off adrenaline. You're going to be uh, hijacking the adrenals to, 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 to have, energy so that you can function but the net effect is you're pushing yourself to kind of this what appears like a menopausal state that really just requires a little bit more energy yeah and it is it is so simple like women and but it just takes time too you know like once they eat more food eat the liver eat the oysters take some progeste like you say it it, it just seems to like it's all of a sudden they're like oh i'm sleeping through the night i'm not having hot flushes anymore like i'm not having any of these um menopausal symptoms and it like to me now i think oh it's so easy but it like because when you're not exposed to all of this, you you think you're doing all the right shit because everyone tells you that you need to, you know, and what we should do a segment yeah. on is uh, PCOS and endometriosis. We should yeah, do one yeah, on yeah. that. I think that'd be a really good one because we get a lot of women come to our program with that issues, those issues, and everything gets better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, it's it's. I, so you go, you go. Sorry, yeah. I, I was going to say that I had a lady recently. Sorry, I cut you off there. It's incredible. No, no, go, go. Um, um, and she was uh, on a low carb diet, PCOS, couldn't get pregnant. Uh, within the space of four weeks of working together, Progest D, because I think it's necessary when you yeah. when you have PCOS, and the fact that she started eating carbs, she was pregnant within four to five weeks of working. She Isn't went to the doctor and I, I, right, and she went to a doctor, and the doctor said, "Well, that." Uh, progesterone is not FDA approved. She just waved. She goes, "I got pregnant, didn't I?" Oh, and I know. It like, and it's like, well, and that's the problem. I think that we have is like not too many doctors when they're evaluating progesterone, when they're evaluating thyroid and and interaction with the estrogen. Mm. There is not enough emphasis on what state that that lady is in. Mm. So like hardly ever they will ask, "Are you skipping breakfast?" Mm. They won't ask anything like that. And they expect all these blood tests to appear. They, they appear normal, so, but they go, well, it seems normal. So, well, what's, what's wrong? It, it, it can't be that. But it's like, if you go and look at all of the research, it shows that when you skip meals or you're undernourished, then your thyroid blood tests appear completely normal. Mm. So you're saying that it's not the thyroid that the woman's getting pregnant. You're saying it's not progesterone, but you're, in, you're, you're dealing with someone who's in a stressed state. And I think I digressed there. So pull me back no, but you know what? We should do another. Um, I was actually thinking that all these topics, we should talk about that, like why blood tests. And that's another time one and not good indicators of hormone levels. Because often I'll say to clients, like, look at your symptoms. Just look at your symptoms. Yeah. That's all you need. Yeah. You don't even need the blood yeah. test. Like, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll it, tell you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's probably another, we can, we can, yeah, talk about another, another time, but well, yeah. well, even the thyroid, you know, when uh, a study I was looking at just again yesterday is like when you, when you're consuming lots of the vegetable fats and the omega threes is they then competitively bind to trans which is your, your kind of thyroid carrying, um, is your thyroid carrier. Mm. So you have something that's bound to that's supposed to be uh, also carrying thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone doesn't have anywhere to go to. So it travels around. It's a bit like when the thyroid receptors hijack pollution. Mm. I used an analogy on social media the other day. It's like driving around a car park, trying to find a space. All these spaces are taken, so you just carry on driving around until there's a place to go. And that's a primary reason why areas in the brain, like the hypothalamus and the pituitary, mm. don't have to start taking out 
more stimulus for the thyroid hormone to, to, to be uh, produced throughout the body is because peripheral conversion is probably appears totally normal. So these blood tests are, are crazy from that perspective. Mm. Mm. It, 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 and it, even I sometimes still get amazed at the results that the women in our program get just from the food. Like it really yeah. is incredible what the food can do for your body. Hey, and reducing yeah, stress yeah. and get rid of the alcohol and, you know, it's actually, it's food can really heal you. Yeah. And that's the problem, isn't it? Getting people to eat on a regular basis. Yep. When, when you're told, I mean, simply getting someone to eat every three, maybe four hours maximum, you know, is, is, is probably one of the most protective things that someone can do. Mm. I mean, I, I just yeah. like, I just like eating, you know, like, I feel like this is, it's, it's just, you know, it, like to, to, to actually enjoy food again and not be scared of food. You know, like every night I have my potatoes cooked in coconut oil and my juice. I, I just love orange juice. Like I just am in love with nudie pulp free juice and I just drink it all yeah. the time and fudge and I have my ice cream, like just to really enjoy food and not be afraid of it anymore, you know, and actually, yeah. Like that, I think that for so many women too is just such a joy, like such a, it, it's free. You feel free, I think. Yeah, I, I remember buying, I went to the shops the other day and I bought six litres of orange juice. <laughs> and by Monday, Monday it had gone and I'd had one glass. I'm like, guys, where's the orange juice gone? I realised I was, I was getting a little bit irate because I hadn't drunk any of it. But then Bunchy I was like, my wife had three litres over the weekend. And the kids got the other one like, Okay, that's kind of uh, that's one of the goals anyway. I don't know why I'm moaning about that. I just yeah, have to yeah. get some more from this. Yeah. Oh, that's so funny. Oh, well, look, we'll probably have to wrap it up now. It's, uh, we've nearly been on probably for an hour, but that was um, so awesome. Thank you so much uh, for, for coming on. Um, and we're going to do this. We're going to do this regularly now. We'll book it in and do it once a month. And we'll, I've got heaps of just from what we've talked about now. I'm like, there's so many little things I'd love to dive deeper into yeah. like the blood tests and, you know, we can talk about this heaps of other things I've, I've thought of. Um, and uh yeah the, the the women will will love it you know it's they can dig a bit deeper into you know understanding why we're telling them to do what they're doing um but just ladies yeah, exactly. eat the fucking food eat the fucking food yeah. yeah it's a great start it's a great start yeah all right well thanks so much uh uh tomo and um i'll see you uh next week okay next well, month i should say okay bye bye bye, bye. bye.